Welcome to Real Vision Live. For Real Vision, I'm Max Sweethy. I'm joined today by Warren Irwin, founder and CIO of Rosso Asset Management, a fund based out of Canada that focuses on natural resources investing. Warren's regularly on the list of top performing hedge funds, and he came very highly recommended as somebody who we should talk to this week about the precious metals mining space. Warren, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Max. Well, we got to have a sort of pre-interview conversation talking about mining and miners in general, and I thought your perspective was really refreshing as somebody who who recognizes uh, the benefits of investing in precious metals miners, but as well uh, recognizes that there are a lot of pitfalls and the same sorts of things that plague uh, finance and companies in general are, are rampant in the uh, precious metals mining space. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the, the bright side and the dark side of mining. Oh, great, great. So uh, maybe what we could do is, uh, would you want a quick introduction for myself as to why some of your listeners may want to uh, listen to me and perhaps uh, you know, give them a little bit of a, a sense of my background, so the, the approach I'm taking as far as analyzing these companies. Yeah, I think that'd be a great place to start. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just academically, uh, you know, I have an MBA, CFA, and I'm an, uh, I'm also uh, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics. So I, I approached these uh, initially, for initially highly quantitatively, and then after you know many decades of going out to visit mines, uh, I have a lot of qualitative. Uh, experience too. I'm not a geologist, so that's the approach I'm, I'm taking here. Sometimes uh, being a geologist can it sometimes be a, a liability in the mining sector because, uh, um, you know, they're often quite optimistic about the projects they have, whereas I, I'm a little more ruthless and saying, well, you know, how do I make money? How does this work for me? Um, so I founded Ross Asset Management in 1998. And uh, so I've been doing this for 22 years. We're uh, uh, you know, we're a top-ranked hedge fund. We've averaged uh, about double the index return each and every year for the past 22 years. And uh, even right now, that's that's still the case even right now, despite being at the bottom of the uh, the metals market. Golds have started to recover, but a lot of the metals have have not. Um, and uh, they're they're pretty much in, in in depressed state. So we're starting to see a turn here with uh, initially being led by gold. So. Uh, that's what I guess we'll, we'll touch on today. Um, also, as far as my experience in mining, I grew up uh, as a kid. I spent four years in Timmins, Ontario, which is uh, one of the top mining camps in the world. Uh, tens and tens of millions of ounces of gold have been mined there. And I was on my first um, mining trip as a five-year-old in 1969. And uh, as a kid, I listened to all the legends about uh, all the money, millions and millions that were made by, um, you know, Mr. Hollinger, uh, Noah Timmins, and all the crowd in, in Timmins in the early, early years who were making fortunes um, on gold discovery. And uh, very, very exciting. You'd have guys, um, really exciting times back in Timmins in those days uh, when the discoveries were made in the early 1900s, like, uh, you know, Benny Hollinger, he was, a, he was a dentist and he went out and uh, would, a lot of these prospectors would be part-timers who'd go out there and they'd find... Uh, these massive rocks with lots of gold in them, and they'd uh, they'd be flipping their claims, making money, you know, doing all sorts of wheeling and dealing, and uh, fortunes were made and lost in in Timmins. It's very, it was a very fascinating place to grow up as the four years as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that is also something we're going to touch on is the way that the excitement around the space can pull people in, and and not everybody who it pulls in is always the type of person you're going to want to be doing business with. But it, it really is in these sorts of times when the sector is turning and, and bullish narratives are starting to take place that you actually kind of paradoxically want to be more cautious. That sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it.
really is in these sorts of times when the sector is turning and, and bullish narratives are starting to take place that you actually kind of paradoxically want to be more cautious than when things are going downhill. Yeah, we're starting to get a little bit of froth, just starting to build. I've been involved in a number of cycles. Some of them have been extraordinarily frothy with crazy, crazy things happening. And for instance, the one in the 1990s I was involved in and I made a pile of money, um, you know, uh, every single junior with, um, you know, with a lying CEO and a property and a listing had a hundred million market cap, which is, you know, that's a pretty big number 20 years ago and or over 20, 20 years ago. So, um, it got really, really frothy back then. Those were in the days of uh, a number of your, your listeners may have heard of Briex and, uh, I, uh, Briex was one of the biggest mining scams. Uh, it got to a market cap of $5.6 uh, billion and it ended up being a complete and total fraud and of course went to zero. So uh, that was one in which I was uh, I was trading and uh, I made uh, many millions of dollars trading it. And uh, part of the reason was I, I managed to find it was a scam before uh, it blew up. So um, that was probably the hottest gold market that I, I've lived through. Although. In the early 90s, when I was uh, you know, too young to really be investing, I, I hear stories from my friends' fathers about uh, how in 1981, uh, when gold hit $800 an ounce, uh, the Vancouver Penny Stock Exchange was no longer a penny stock exchange because every single junior, instead of trading in the pennies, it was trading over a dollar. So that was a pretty frothy time, too, where you had gold go from... Uh, you know, a few hundred bucks to 800. And of course it collapsed back to the two, 300 range in the, in the nineties again. And now it's, now it's uh, testing, you know, creating new highs here at the, these levels around the $2,000 level. So it's been an interesting run in the gold market for sure over my career. Well, I think we should start to focus more on the current market, a little bit on your view on, on precious metals in general. Uh, we can get into the mining space, and then we can start to talk about some of the things from a fundamental perspective that you like to see from a junior miner, and then we can close on the things that you kind of want to keep at arm's reach. Okay. Well, where I am right now, I'm not a raw, raw gold market bull like a lot of people are, and, uh, as, and many people are aware. The thesis is... Uh, the U.S. government's printing money like crazy, and hence, um, you know, gold is one of the few places, uh, or it is a good place to put your money to to uh, shield yourself from that. And um, in the gold mining sector, where I focus is in the junior mining sector. So I stay away from the barracks and Newmonts and things like that. And uh, so I have a slightly different view than some people that are stepping into that area of the market. Uh, that's. Uh, we heard over the weekend you had uh, Berkshire Hathaway stepped in and bought some barrack, and uh, you're hearing various other players like Bridgewater stepping in and increasing their, their exposure to gold. Um, so some of the big guys are coming in. Now, I, I've been, again, I've been through a few of these cycles, and and I'll, I'll talk to them as they relate to the junior golds. Where, and the junior golds is where you really get the massive juice. This is where fortunes are made in a good, jun in a good gold market with the juniors. Um, the concern I have right now is typically gold is, is purchased by, uh, you know, central banks and and uh, Indians are from India are, are big consumers of uh, of gold. My concern at this stage of the cycle is it runs pretty hard, pretty fast. And the typical buyers, especially under this COVID uh, in this COVID market, they're very value conscious. So I think a lot of them have stepped away and are not buying the gold that they used to, and they're very value conscious, so they like to buy on, on pullbacks. So you've lost a significant amount of your uh, your buyers. Also, I'm seeing instances where central banks have stopped their buying or curtailed their buying because of the high price of gold. And there's other instances where people are in financial hardship right now who currently have sitting on gold bullion are turning it into gold traders for cash. So that's the negative part of this, the, the funds flow into the gold sector. But then how can they compete when you've got some of the massive U.S. hedge funds stepping into the gold market to buy gold? So that's the dynamic near as I can tell right now. There's massive amounts of money going into gold. And uh, unfortunately, the traditional buyers have stepped, seem to have are stepping away. So when the flow of money stops coming from these big hedge funds, uh, the, the game will be over. So you have to be very cognizant of that because when it turns, it can be quite violent and it won't be pretty. Um, now, specifically related to trading the gold market as it relates to juniors, uh, this is the interesting thing, and, and nobody ever points this out, and that's why I'm about to do it. Um, 
the reason people buy gold, and I have uh, you know pretty significant gold bullion holdings. The reason people buy uh, gold is because you can't print it. It takes a lot of effort to to find it, mine it, refine it, and and so um, it's not as easy to print as U.S. dollars are. So. That changes a little bit when you look at the junior gold sector, because if there's one group that is at least as good at the printing presses as the Federal Reserve, it's the junior gold miners. And you're seeing it right now. Uh, every I'm getting my my phone's ringing off the hook with uh, junior gold miners raising money and they're issuing tons and tons of junior gold paper. So in the last cycle, I personally believe the last gold cycle, which took place in the early 2000s, uh, and the, the hit, I think the high was around the $1,900 level. Uh, that was the, the junior miners did not perform quite as well as I had hoped, in part because there were so many small investment dealers bringing so many juniors to market, flooding the market with junior gold paper. So it was very, very difficult for these stocks to run because they just kept the printing presses of these junior gold shares were just going like crazy. So that was a, that was a bit of a problem. And, um, and as a result, they didn't appreciate as much as they could. So that's, those are some of the things you need to worry about in the junior gold market, not necessarily in the, with the majors when you're investing in a Newmont or a, or a Barrick, that type of thing. Why so, do they issue equity instead of taking on debt? Well, as you know, <clears throat> these juniors, usually what they generally have is they have a management team, they have a property, and uh, they have some uh, some explorers, like, as in geologists, who go out there. So they're they're generally junior exploration. So they're they're exploring for gold. So they're they're not in production, not generating cash flow. So these are the ones. Uh, now, at this point, I guess your, your your listeners are wondering, well, why would you ever be dumb enough to to invest in junior golds? And <clears throat> over the past twenty two years, excuse me, <clears throat> the past twenty two years, um, we've made about half our profits. Uh, investing in gold juniors, and we've made some significant amount of money in them. For instance, I remember uh, one gold company, it set the record for uh, for the amount of money we've made in the name. We made 37 times our money on the name. And uh, those are pretty significant numbers. And when I remember, you know, like in investing, if you make 37 times your money, you really don't need to start with a lot of money to begin with to make an absolute fortune. So, uh, <clears throat> over the years, some of the names we've been involved in have been like uh, like Aurelion. We owned about five or six percent of Aurelion. We sold that to um, to Kinross, you know, possibly about ten years ago or a little over ten years ago for about a billion three. I was involved in Gold Eagle again, owned five or six percent of it. We sold it uh, to um, to Gold Corp for a billion three. I owned a significant chunk of Virginia Gold Mines. We sold that. To uh, again, Gold Corp. I think it was six hundred million, and then we sold it. Sold um, the royalty uh, to uh, Cisco Gold Royalties at a later date. I forget the price on that because I, I, I long since sold my shares. I was also involved in a big silver discovery in in, uh, in Argentina called Aqualine. We found the Navidad silver discovery. I think it's probably one of the biggest undeveloped silver mines in the world. We sold that about ten years ago. Of course, today it's still not. In production because it's in Argentina, it's a tough place to work. Um, and uh, you know, I'm involved in names, uh, more household names like Osisco. Osisco built the Malarctic mine in uh, in Canada, so it's been very, very lucrative for us. We've made a ton of money, but there are quite a number of uh, pitfalls in the in the junior gold mining sector. And um, you know, it goes way back even to the days of Mark Twain when he when he said. Uh, What's the definition of a gold mine? It's a it's a hole in the ground with a liar on top. So there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of shenanigans in the sector. So you need to be very very careful. But but the amount of the the rewards you can make are can be fabulous. So that's why uh, it's high risk high reward, and that's why people uh, like the sector. And for you know retail investors who love uh, love a bit of adrenaline and some gambling, it's a uh, it's a fascinating and interesting market that they could. Uh, Make make a bunch of money, and if they're if they're careful with their their money and who they who they back. Well, I think it's a pretty strong case for why one might want to invest in junior miners. I guess the next question would be, you know, what do you look for in a junior miner? How do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Yeah, you know, I could get into the boring stuff like you know, solid management team, proven track record, you know, uh, 
um, uh, you know, they're in a good jurisdiction, you know, all that type of stuff. And that's, that's a canned answer, <clears throat> but life in the junior market is not always that easy. And, you know, in some of the wacky names I've, I've, uh, I've made money on, sometimes I've actually had to, you know, plug my nose and, and make an investment because, okay, the, I love the property. I love the jurisdiction. The geo is top notch, but the CEO was a complete loser, scam artist and a promoter. So you're always trading off or the other one is you've got a great management team, a great property, but Oh man, it's in Argentina. And I'm going, you know, okay, it's in Argentina. Well, what province in Argentina is, it? is one, begin, you know, is it one that begins with an S or not? And that's the rule of thumb in Argentina. If it begins with an S, you have a chance of making money. If it doesn't, uh, they're generally anti-mining. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in mining deals in, uh, in a number of places like Colombia and Ecuador. And uh, I've looked at deals in, uh, back in the day in Venezuela. I've, I've invested in Guyana, Suriname, Brazil, Chile, you know, you name it, Peru. Uh, I've been all around South America and in Africa, too, even in West Africa. Um, West Africa, South Africa, uh, the DRC, there's some tremendous copper projects there in the DRC. South Africa, there's some great platinum situations. Uh, so I've been all around Africa. So there's some really uh, dodgy jurisdictions. And I've also obviously invested in uh, in Canada and the U.S. from time to time, and uh, more, more so in Canada than the U.S. But uh, there, so, so it's not exactly an exact science where you can actually, uh, you know, uh, go to your textbook and get a bunch of ratios and, and choose, choose the correct one to invest in. But uh, um, but in preparation for this call, what I did do is I put together a reasonably entertaining list of 35 things to look out for <laughs> of companies you really don't want to be investing in. And uh, over the years, and we're talking, you know, many decades of investing in the junior gold sector, there are a number of things I've seen. And uh, I think by going through them, uh, you might get a sense of uh, some of the things and some of the shenanigans that happens in the junior gold market and things to look out for when, when it gets frothy. And the frothiest gold market I was involved in was the one in the mid to late 90s. And that was around the whole BREEX situation. And if you haven't, if you're not familiar with BREEX minerals, you really need to read an article I wrote uh, probably about, uh, I think it was 2017, I, I wrote it. It's about four pages long, super short, of my experience with BREEX. And um, so, uh, I was I was in my early 30s, had virtually no money, but I managed to make three and a half million on it, and it was a total complete scam. And I explained how uh, I was a believer initially, and how I became clear that was indeed a scam. And it shows you a number of the things that can't happen in the mining sector. And uh, the regulators have tried their best to regulate out scams like that, but you know, trust me, they're still going to happen. So, um, so if you Google my name, uh, Warren Irwin, and then Briex you will probably find it. I think it's sitting on CEO.ca somewhere and it's a four pager. And I think you'll find it very entertaining and well worth your time. So um, on that, um, so there's some great, I think great things are written down here about that. Are, I hope you find reasonably humorous. Um, so things I look for to stay away from uh, in the, when I, when I visit, when I do research on a junior gold mining miner, I look at, uh, I'm, I'm a, I stay away from, from companies that spend uh, heavily on uh, on promotion. So basically they take your money, instead of taking your money and putting it in the ground, looking for gold, they spend it promoting the company. And that's never a good sign. Um, I always get concerned also about super excited geologists and you try and dig into it a little bit and say, okay, why are you so excited? And then you find out there's really no good reason they're excited. They just kind of think their job is to be excited and be excitable to investors and promote their company. So I stay away from that because the geologists just aren't, uh, aren't honest. Um, and uh, again, you know, some geologists just believe it's their job to be excited. I prefer the geologists. They'll, they'll tell you the pros and cons and give you a sense of the risk. Um, we're looking at uh, guys, another big warning sign when I'm at a mining conference is uh, uh, the guys that hire, you know, booth babes. And that's an old, an old school thing where basically they hire uh, very attractive women to attract men to the, to their, to their booth and they uh, when you dig into it with them they really are not that knowledgeable they may have just been hired a few days ago and really don't know much about it so that's a sign that you'd probably stay away from that company because no serious mining company uh, junior that i'm aware of really does that and that's a really good that's one of the top signs i think that uh, you're dealing with a scam artist who's just promoting a bunch of baloney um i've seen instances here where the ceo has had a 
I was I remember looking at the CFO compensation one junior minor and it was eight hundred thousand dollars, which is a big number for a small junior that doesn't have a lot of money. And uh, it turned out the CEO was having an affair with the the uh, the married CFO was having CEO was having an affair with the married CFO, and they were somehow she managed to make eight hundred thousand a year. So that was that was another warning sign that company went to zero. It was a total scam. Um, constantly promoting the same project year after year. Uh, you'll see this in this mining cycle, there'll be a number of projects that were promoted last cycle and it didn't work out last cycle. They may have been promoted even the previous cycle, they didn't. So they, they're kind of retread projects. You have to be very careful with them. Look for things like family members on the payroll, family members on the board, big director's fees. Um, big things are about to happen that never ever really happen. They're perpetually big things about to happen. Big um, SGNA, big, big, big overheads. CEO is not owning a lot of the stock, no institutional investors. Um, Vancouver used to be, uh, it was years and years ago, there was an article out of Forbes calling it the scam capital of the world. So they, uh, they've cleaned up their act quite a bit. But uh, whenever I look at a company from Vancouver, I always spend a little bit extra due diligence on it because there still remains in Vancouver a tiny bit of the culture that was left from uh, the, the really bad days of decades ago. Um, but uh, there are some really good companies out of Vancouver now, but just it, it's uh, something I, I spend a little bit extra time with. Um, I remember I have instances where CEOs own, let's say, uh, a share in the helicopter company that the company uses, and they, um, they brag in the golf course about all the money they're making by, by using their helicopter company and selling helicopter time to the company that they run. And uh, it's a way in which they strip, comp strip money out of the company. They also strip money out of the company through, uh, I know one instance here in uh, British Columbia where the, um, um, the, uh, the CEO would actually rent pickup trucks by the hour to his junior mining company. He also was renting for $400 a day an ambulance to the junior mining company because everybody needs an ambulance on site just to be safe. Well, he was renting it for $400 a day and it was basically a pickup truck with a cap on the back and a stretcher in the back of it. And that was viewed as being a, an ambulance. There's also, you know, management has been known to take, you know, kickbacks on uh, drilling contracts. When you're drilling for drilling for ore, they'll, they'll insist on the drilling company kicking them back some money. So that's one of the things you have to worry about here too. Um, just, just recently, I'm aware of a CEO who took in a whole bunch of money from a large strategic investor and he immediately spent half a million dollars on a closing party in uh, in uh, some uh, foreign jurisdiction, I'll say. I don't want to name it because I think everybody will know who it is. But uh, some foreign jurisdiction threw half a million dollars in an incredible closing party. I wasn't invited to it. I don't know why. But I hear the party was quite good. And that's a way in which, uh, you know, you know, money being put in the company gets vaporized. Um, I just go on and on here with... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, probably a little bit more. I'm not sure your knowledge base of your of your listeners, but things like uh, what people like to do to reignite excitement is they'll come out with a really really nice drill hole. But when you do the di due diligence on it, you'll find that that drill hole was drilled last cycle. So they're just trying to rehash old news, and uh, that's an age old trick. Um, I, you know, I just go on and on. I got a whole list here, but um, so I guess. You know, some of those things they seem like you would be able to tell just by going back through the, the company's materials and seeing this is the exact same drill hold they had. But some of it you have to do a little bit more deep digging. How do you go about finding things like the the obviously you know the CFO having an affair with the CEO is not publicized. Uh, I imagine that that rental company was not a publicly traded company. Same thing with the helicopter company. How do you get into some of these private companies where there might not be as much information out there? Yeah, well, they're they're all in all those instances. Yeah, they're publicly traded companies. So what you do is you just listen to scuttlebutt. So I had a I have people telling me though they're on the golf course with with, with X Y Z. He was bragging about the helicopter he owned. Uh, I'm, I was at a I was at a mining conference and I was went for drinks at the bar later on and I, I watched the interaction between the CEO and the CFO. Um, it's sort of just getting getting involved, rolling up your sleeves, and getting into the to this the scuttlebutt, and you'll very quickly find out what's been uh, what's been going on and. Um, so there's there's a lot of a lot of that. So I encourage uh, any anybody who wants to be involved in the junior space once COVID's over 
and there are some mining conferences. Just get out to meet the people you'll be investing with, and uh, you'll learn you'll learn a ton. And also, I'm finding today, which um, sort of pioneered in the '90s, was these online chats are pretty good for scuttlebutt. I find that uh, there's some really interesting scuttlebutt from time to time that comes up. A lot of stuff uh, people can't share online because it's it's too damning for the individuals involved. But um, I find it's uh, it's a very interesting uh, place to uh, to pick up some some of the mining gossip that's going around. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have a few questions here from the audience we might want to get into. So, uh, London boy, I'm assuming that just means he's from London. Uh, pretty much picked up that a lot of your exits came from the the property actually being sold to a major. What what percentage would you say of these junior miners actually start pulling stuff out of the ground themselves versus it getting sold off to another company? Well, that is an outstanding question, almost something I would have planted actually. But um, it's an outstanding question. And there, here, here's the approach I take to it. I only invest in junior mining companies that I believe will have a discovery of the caliber that a major mining company would want to buy. And if anywhere during the process, I find that, well, this is going to be a nice little discovery. It's going to be too small. Um, I try, I exit it before that happens. And I generally don't invest in companies, which I know right from the beginning are not going to be world-class discoveries. So yes, it is incorrect. I, I specifically cater to big deposits that I would put into production. I would want to buy if I was a major. And with respect to putting things into production, you're talking about juniors putting things into production. Generally, tier one deposits are not put into production by juniors. They're always, almost always bought by the majors. So when you hear the stories about, oh, we've got a great deposit, we're going to put it into production, I generally run away from that because junior mining companies who just recently made a discovery generally don't have the skill set to put something into production. Um, sometimes they say that in order to uh, just move the project along and they know they're going to get bought out eventually. So they just do a number of the, uh, the blocking and tackling that would be required to be done by the major in any event. Um, but in the reality is uh, there's only one instance that I could recall of a, of a significant high quality deposit being put into to, uh, production by a junior. And I focus on um, I focus on larger larger discoveries that the majors will want to buy. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a specific question about a company that recently has had some bad press. Um, do you have any thoughts on Nova Gold, or are you at all plugged into uh, some of the the bad press around their accounting that has come out? No, I'm not involved in uh, Nova Gold. It's been something I've watched the last you know 15, 20 years. Um, but I've um, I have not been following it that closely. No. Okay, and then I guess just more generally, you know, you and I in our conversation before, you said you're not the type of guy who knows everything about every name in the space. You have a very concentrated portfolio and a couple of names that you know really well. One, I think it would be great to get some of those names for the audience, um, why you like them, and then just talking a little bit more generally about why you think having a concentrated approach with a couple of names that you know really well is the right way to go. Yeah, so over the past... 22 years, part of the reason we've, we've been successful is we focused on less than 20 names, usually 15 to 20. And then even within that, we usually have a core, a core holdings somewhere around, uh, you know, five to 10 names. So um, with the, when investing with juniors, um, sometimes you need to just seed them reasonably early. You've got a good team, a good project, and you just, you seed them and you watch what they do with that money. And then over time, it's kind of like you're a farmer. You you plant the seeds, and then as you as you watch the companies grow, there's a couple you'll you'll weed out, and then by the time they get uh, a little bit more mature, you'll have you'll have higher quality names. So there is some there is a planting and weeding process that I go through. Not unlike a farmer, farming uh, you've got to basically start at the in the earlier stages and work work through with management team, and then along the ways you'll you'll call some of them as they. They don't deliver up to expectations or they start doing things that you're, you're not um, in agreement with. So um, that's kind of the approach I take there. Now, with respect to giving a, giving a few names, um, I generally don't like giving specific names. And here's the reason why. I remember um, I gave uh, a friend of mine was bugging me years ago. And this is a few, probably 20 years ago. He was asking me for some names. This is a dear friend of mine. 
So he goes, Warren, Warren, you know, give me some names. You know, you're really good at this uh, picking gold juniors. And I, I said, well, I'll give you, tell you what, I'll give you two names. And of course, one went to zero and one went up uh, about 20 times. I think it was 20, yeah, about, yeah, about 20 times the other one went up. So of course, my friend didn't buy half and half. He, he, he invested, he chose one. And that was the one that went to zero. So therein lies the issue with, the, with giving names uh, on the junior gold market is a significant number of them um, don't pan out as expected. And uh, so in the earlier stage ones, I, I don't generally like giving out giving out names. And as far as the later stage ones, I don't um, uh, I don't have a ton of later stage golds in my portfolio right now. Probably the latest stage one I have is. I own some Cornerstone Resources. Uh, they own a share of the Cascabel Copper Gold Discovery in, in Ecuador. They have about, within that copper discovery, it's about um, 22 million ounces of gold. Um, I believe they're gonna be bought out within the next six months at a substantial premium to market. So I don't feel that uncomfortable giving that name there. So it's, there's two companies involved in it. Cornerstone owns about ec economic uh, value, about 23% of, of the Cascabel discovery in a company called Solgold, mainly traded in London, owns the remainder. Solgold is a little bit more liquid. Cornerstone is considerably less liquid. So your investors can, can take a peek at it. I think they'll find that it's pretty a uh, unique situation. Other shareholders involved in it are, are BHP, largest company mining company in the world, and uh, Newcrest, one of the top um, gold mining companies in the world. So I, I'm there. I was there super early stage before those two majors got in. And um, you could, it's been said my due diligence and that of uh, two major mining companies. So it's a reasonably safe one to invest in. 22 million ounces of gold, 4 billion tons of copper ore. You're also going to be able to play the, uh, the copper play too. So uh, copper is uh, probably going to do well too. So along that line of, of majors taking stakes in companies, is that anything that you look at specifically? Like we just had all the uh, you know people saying, you know, Warren Buffett just bought this company. And I'm sure that there are people who went out and bought Barrett Gold because Warren bought it. Do you pay attention at all to what the majors are buying into, what they take stakes in? And if so, are there any majors in particular that you think have good decision makers? Yeah, you know, it's... Um Majors, when you look at their track record, uh, they, they make a lot of mistakes when they're buying uh, buying gold properties. And, you know, I could go on and on with those mistakes. So generally what I, the place I like to be is I like to be the one selling to the, to the majors. And um, uh, so um, I try and get in way, way before the majors and I'm small enough, nimble enough, and I have the contacts and uh, I'm aggressive enough that I get in way before the majors do. Um, and along those lines, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when, when we sold Aqualine, which was uh, the Navidad Silver Discovery in Argentina, we sold the Pan American Silver maybe you know a decade ago. It's still not in production today. And Pan American is a very smart silver company. And um, despite them being smart and accomplished and have operations in, in Argentina, they were still unable to get the project uh, green lighted. Also, um, I've sold some projects to um, to majors who really have not uh, um, had the the full uh, the, the deposit come to, to their expectations. So they've possibly paid too much. So that's uh, so majors occasionally they get a little uh, a little trigger happy. Generally, in the in a, in a boom boom gold market, uh, they're under a lot of pressure from their investors for growth, and they'll make acquisitions that are some at times foolish. So uh, that's something you need to be aware of. And then, of course, in the downturn of the mining market, uh, the investors are on their case, saying, "Well, you need to focus on your core competencies, divest, focus on your key properties, work at cost reduction, that sort of thing." So it's a cycle I've seen many, many times, and uh, I think the cycle we're going into now. Is we'll see the majors through you know with with guys like Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway and and other majors major uh, funds in the U S buying these major gold companies. They'll eventually the price will go up. They'll have a good currency and then they'll start making acquisitions and uh, they'll be under pressure to make acquisitions. It's not all of them will work out. Some of them may, but uh, that's we're going to probably see here um, an acquisition cycle start happening. Uh, over the next uh, few years if this gold market continues. So do you think that creates opportunity to maybe be a little bit riskier as that pressure is going to ramp up from the majors if you can get into some of these junior mines? 
That's a great, you know, once again, that's a great question. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what some people try and do in these gold sectors. What they'll do is as the cycle get, goes on, gets stronger, they'll increase their risk profile. So they'll go from the majors, mid-tiers, then to the juniors. And um, as it gets hotter, uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll go down, uh, down the food chain a bit because as when in a robust gold market, uh, being invested in a junior is not as risky as it is uh, uh, on the other side of a bull market because the major majority of juniors are, have very little in the way of assets. They have a lot in the way of dreams and are doing a good gold market. But when you look at it, uh, I've been through enough junior gold market bears and I've watched so many of them wiped out. Uh, you don't want to be owning junior gold stocks at the end of the cycle, no matter how much value you think is in there. Um, one little trick I'll share with your investors, uh, we're a few years away from this, hopefully, but at the end of the gold cycle, what often happens is the junior gold gets smoked pretty hard. And you'll have a junior with $5 million in cash, and it'll have a market cap of around $2.5 million. And people will say, well, Warren, you know, you got to get out there and buy this company because they got $5 million in cash, and it's trading at $2.5 million market cap. The problem with that, and this happened especially in the – in the cycle of the 90s, I saw it. Um, these uh, promoters will hang on to that cash and they will not put it in the ground and they will strip that money out over time in terms of in, in salaries, consulting fees or whatever, because they all know that once we're into a downturn for the junior golds, it could be five to 10 years before there's another upswing. So they'll hoard that cash and they'll, they'll draw a salary and they'll try and keep the company running. So it's not being spent on, on exploration and that money within you know, a few years will be gone. So that's not a good, that's a value trap and you don't wanna get suckered into that at the end of this cycle. So then what would be something that you would like to see them spending that $5 million on? Because I'm sure there are some, some other companies that, that are good value plays and they're putting that $5 million to work uh, in the right way. What, what would be the, the types of line items that you would like to see them spending that money on? Well, you know, um, in, uh, the, the, that specific example was in a in the negative gold market. So uh, we're just actually coming out of that, and we're moving into a good gold market. So that's, uh, but in a in a, a bad gold market, any junior with cash should, you know, cut salaries to the bare bone, cut cut ex all expenses to next to nothing, hoard that cash as best they can, and then keep an eye out for other juniors who actually have very very good properties and pick those off at the near or close to the bottom of the market for, for next to nothing. And, you know, there's a number of instances of this. For instance, uh, Cisco Mining, they'll, they'll tell anybody that uh, the Canadian Malarctic uh, mine, which sold for billions upon billions of dollars, they acquired that in the downturn for $70,000. So that's the type of value that you could find um, at the bottom of the gold cycle. So any junior that does have cash, instead of having the CEO and his team strip the money out for their own personal benefit, uh, if you have a dedicated group who cuts salaries to next to nothing and, and hoards that money to buy value at the bottom of the market, those are the kind of guys you really want to back. Okay. So we touched on this a little bit before, but we got another question about you know political risks and specifically frontier and developing markets. I know you said you're not afraid to to get into some of these markets. Is there anything that is different about investing them that you have to be careful about? Does your time frame have to be different? Uh, your position sizing? Is there anything that maybe you treat differently about a developing market versus, say, buying a mine in Canada? That's... Yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting question in that, uh, my view, there's a, there's a bit of a circle what happens, and it usually happens in South America and Africa. It, it doesn't happen in more, uh, more established jurisdictions. For instance, I view Chile as an established mining jurisdiction, Peru as an established mining jurisdiction, Canada and the U.S. are established mining jurisdictions. But outside of that, there are a few others, but the cycle typically goes like this. Um, uh, we do not, we're not getting, the comp country is not getting any exploration dollars into the company to find new mines, to build their economy, to make, make uh, millions upon millions for the government and for, create jobs, create training. And so the, what they'll do is they'll create in financial incentives for a junior mining company to go in there and make a discovery. So ABC junior mining company goes into, let's say Argentina is a great country for this. They'll go into uh, Argentina when the fiscal terms are great. 
and their things are awesome. And then they go out and they'll make a massive new big discovery. Well, next thing you know, the politicians start getting kind of greedy. And they're saying, well, you know, uh, these big bad, these big bad Canadian mining companies are coming to Argentina. They're they're stealing our resources. Of course, big bad Canadian mining company spend a ton of money, often tens of millions of dollars, to find a find a find a discovery, work together on a mine plan, and just as they're ready to permit it, the government has their hand out. Um, Ecuador did this to uh, to Kinross back when we sold the Marillion, uh, and. And that just killed investment in, in Ecuador for quite a long time, maybe as long as a decade. And then, then the politicians figure, well, maybe you know we shouldn't have been quite as hard um, on these junior miners after they found something, because they did come in here when there was a fair amount of risk. They did put their risk capital, they put a, hard, a lot of hard work, they went to the jungles, and not every junior found a discovery, so we have to let them make their money. And, and then, okay, then they'll say, well, maybe we should improve in our mining laws again. So it's a bit of a circle. And, um, but greedy politicians after, the, after a big discovery in all countries, um, their attitudes change. And I've seen it happen in uh, quite a number of them. Um, and generally they're lesser developed countries who don't have the level of sophistication that they know that there is a bit of a cycle and you're better off far better off creating mining laws that mirror that of established jurisdictions, not unlike mirroring some of the, the Canadian mining laws, put them in place and just let, let that go for a few decades and see what kind of mining industry you can develop. Because if you're just basically changing, you're changing your rules, uh, you know, every other year you're putting in, in fact, Ecuador put in a windfall profits tax as soon as they knew that uh, Aurelian was a, a rich gold deposit, and that just killed killed the Rillion and killed uh, all all investment in Ecuador for quite a number of years. When people want to invest in these lesser developed countries, people want stability, and they want fairness, and they know want to make sure that they're the money they spend in these countries is going to, is going to be um, well worth it in the end if they do find something that's not going to be taken away. And the other more extreme example is uh, you know nationalism. Uh, there's there's a number of instances around the world where a junior company's gone into a uh, a country and just had their project nationalized after uh, after finding it. So you, gotta watch, okay. you have to watch that where they are. And right now, Ecuador is pro mining. So hopefully, they'll they'll be pro mining for many decades to come and won't fall into the same traps as some of their neighbors have again. Okay. Um, now we've we've talked a lot about gold, and you mentioned uh, some silver mines and platinum mines that you were interested in. We actually got a question from Bjorn who wants to know if you have any views on platinum, and I'll expand that question to be any other metals, precious or otherwise, that you think are sort of turning. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the, one of the biggest trends in the metals market right now is. Um, is to deal with the automotive sector and the electrification of vehicles, right? So we're we're hearing a lot of the hype about uh, you know lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, and um, and then with respect to platinum, platinum as you may may be aware is uh, a key ingredient in uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars, right? So the Japanese have made significant investments in uh, in uh, Ivanhoe's uh, mines in South Africa. Um, uh, I believe it's Flat Reef, and they've uh, they've gone involved in there because they believe they need platinum for their fuel cell. But when I look at electric cars, I go, I don't see fuel cells being the car of choice. I see us going more the typical lithium battery type of thing. Taking a look, let's say, at battery technologies, you look at the typical battery, you've got lithium. There's more lithium in the world that will... There's no shortage of lithium at all right now. Lithium is kind of like iron ore. There's no shortage of it. The people that will make money on it are the ones with the best logistics. Also, there's a, there's some technological risk, too, that could really hurt the price of lithium because there are a number of countries with with massive uh, solars and lots of brine that contains the lithium and with some uh, some improvements in uh, in mineral chemistry, they should be able to take some of the nasties that are currently stopping that from coming to market. So I'm not a lithium fan, never have been. There's too much of it. The big guys will make all the money. That's not for me. It's just like me. I don't invest in iron ore. Iron ore, it's, it's a big guy's game. There's so much iron ore out there. It's basically a matter of who has the biggest operation, the lowest cost of production. 
Taking a look at, let's say, the other battery metals, nickel. I love nickel, nickel, specifically nickel sulfides. I've been looking for my career for decades since the Boise Bay discovery in the early 90s for good nickel sulfides. There was recently one made, big discovery made in, in Australia. Nickel sulfides are really amazing discoveries. They're extraordinarily tough to find. They're very, very rare. And that's the nickel sulfate is a type of mine being a type of nickel being mined in, let's say, Sudbury, Canada is one of the biggest uh, uh, sulfide mining camps. Now let's talk about cobalt. You, you, a lot of your investors probably heard about cobalt. Cobalt, the vast majority of it comes from the DRC. And uh, some hedge funds not that long ago decided, well, hey, battery technologies, cobalt's needed in these batteries. Let's run it up. So they tripled the price of cobalt, and uh, it's since collapsed. And uh, people were all over me trying to invest in cobalt. So I'm not investing in cobalt because uh, uh, everybody knows the production issues with cobalt. The DRC, um, I'm quite familiar with. I've been there. I, I know a number of people doing business there. It's not a place that the world is going to rely on for the majority of their cobalt to, f to fuel the uh, electric car revolution. So in the laboratories around the world today, building, uh, designing new batteries, they are, I assure you, everyone in the world is trying to engineer out cobalt. So cobalt could have this little run right now where people are still using cobalt, but everybody will try and replace uh, that metal. And um, they will try and replace all these really difficult metals. Uh, they're difficult to find with the easiest to find metals. And if that means the battery is a tiny bit less efficient, so be it. So I'm not specifically investing in anything directly related to the batteries for that technology, for that reason. Technology is going to change. And they're going to switch from these fancy metals uh, like cobalt to anything else to substitute it so that we're not having to rely on the DRC for it. Now, taking a look at the electrical revolution, the biggest no-brainer I see out there is copper. There is not really a replacement for copper. Copper is needed. We will need uh, infrastructure that will require copper to charge vehicles. We will need all the extra pounds that are required in a car to uh, electric car. They need more pounds of copper than an internal combustion engine. And um, I think copper is the place to be. So that's where I particularly like, you know, Sol Gold slash Cornerstone in that not only do you have 22 million ounces of gold for the precious metals play, but you also have 4 billion tons of, uh, of uh, copper ore. And uh, it's one of the top five undeveloped copper deposits in the world. So I think going forward, uh, some interesting areas to play where you're not taking a risk on the technology and where people are headed, whether it's fuel cell, whether it's electric, or whether it's uh, cobalt using the batteries or not, stick with, stick with copper. They will need copper. There's, there's no substitute for copper right now. And uh, it's a place to be, I think. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Well, we did. I know, uh, as you said, one majors aren't your game and two individual names aren't your game. Um, but we got a question from Gabriella about Kinross and Yamana. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those two companies? And then just expanding that question to be why you don't like the majors or why it's just not your game. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I bring a lot to the table to try and indicate where, uh, where you know, Newmont and Barrick are going. If you take a look at, <clears throat> at their, uh, the relationship of the price of Barrick and Newmont, some of the majors, to the price of gold, the correlation is much higher than it is with a junior. I have made a ton of money with a junior gold who's made a discovery in a lousy gold market. So I'm not beholden to, oh, are the U.S. speculators going to run the price of gold up? So uh, I find that there's considerably more, uh, I guess, in the hedge fund world, we call it alpha in the junior gold market. That's where having a high level of expertise in it is very helpful because, um, you know, we're finding a lot of these, a lot of these discoveries were made when gold wasn't on a bit of a tear. And uh, um, gold doesn't need to be in a tear. If you find 10 million ounces of gold, you, it's going to be worth a lot of money whether uh, gold's 1,500 or 2,000. And um, whereas with Barrick and Newmont, moving from, two, from 1,500 to 2,000 makes a massive difference because the majority of that gap will head to their bottom line. So it's, again, so I hope, you, I hope that, that's a little clearer. 
No, oh, that's good. Um, also, we have a question about royalty companies versus miners. Uh, yeah. What do you? Yeah, what do you think about royalty companies? Well, they've definitely been the flavor of the day for a lot of people, and they've done very, very well. Uh, people have made a lot of money on names like uh, you know the, the big stalwart out there is Franco Nevada, and uh, they'll go out and uh, it's one way to play it. And the good thing about it is they have their um, operational risk spread amongst a whole bunch of different companies. They're not operators. They have very, very high margins. They take the cream right off the top, so it really doesn't matter uh, um, uh, to a lot on the on the operational front, so long as the mine is actually in production. The other big benefit of the of them is that they, um, uh, as if, if they have a royalty on a property and they put it into production, as that property grows uh, with uh, ex more additional exploration dollars, which somebody else is spending, they still get the same percentage of that uh, additional amount of gold being found. So they're 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 not a bad way at all to to um, to invest in the gold sector. And um, but for me personally. Um, uh, they're not that exciting for me, and I, and I love getting involved in the, in the junior space where you could uh, look for the big wins. And they're, you know, Canada is rife with, um, you know, the discoveries of uh, massive, massive gold discoveries. For instance, uh, Hemlo, uh, fortunes were made with Hemlo. Fortunes were made with um, a lot of these gold discoveries. And it, I'll tell you, there's nothing more exciting to be involved with the uh, with the junior gold uh, junior gold miner that's made a big discovery, fortunes are made, and I've watched uh, I've watched friends made many many tens of millions of dollars on a, on a discovery, and uh, there's nothing like it, and that's why I focus on that sector. Okay, well, I think uh, it would be a good time to sort of give viewers a, a look at what they can expect, probably not in the near term, but when uh, when the music stops and when it's time to get out, what are the things that you look for to signify uh, the end of the cycle when, it, when it's maybe time to take some risk off? Yeah, yeah, when you're, uh, the best rule of thumb I find any time in any cycle is when you're feeling you're pretty smart and you, <laughs> You just made a ton of money. You go, man, I'm really smart. Boy, this game is easy. This is the most amazing thing to invest in in the whole world. And that, at that point, you should start <laughs> gradually taking your money off. And remember, too, when you're taking your profits, um, you don't need to take it off all at once. You could gradually say, well, okay, I've, I've made a lot of money. These valuations are way higher than I ever expected. Maybe I'll take a quarter off now and maybe another quarter off in a few more months. But uh, trust me, on the mining, in the gold sector downturn, you do not want to own a single junior gold mining stock because they will get absolutely crushed. But in an upswing, on the junior miners are extraordinarily fun to play. They can be very, very lucrative. But remember, when it's over, it's not Warren Buffett, it's not, it's not value, it's not Benjamin Graham value. Doesn't matter, there's no, these stocks are gonna be coming out at you and there'll be so many junior golds for sale, you wouldn't believe it. Get out of them as soon as you see that the cycle starting to turn over. There is don't be trying to buy value. You'll be catching. It's like catching a falling knife. You will not. It will be a few more years, and then when gold, the gold market, when the junior gold market is just bottomed right out, everything's been completely crushed. That's when you should possibly start looking at uh, getting back into them. But be careful. The downside on the junior gold market is ferocious. But on the upside, there could be nothing more fun to play in a good gold market than the junior gold markets for this for the more aggressive speculator. Well, Warren, thank you so much for taking the time today. It was a lot of fun. It was a really unique view on the gold market from somebody with years of experience. Thank you so much to everybody for for watching and and again for you for joining us. You're very welcome. Really, really nice chatting with you, Max. And uh, to anybody who decides to try the junior gold market, all the best and uh, good luck with it. All right, thank you. Uh, cheers, thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.